breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, that you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, oh, oh Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. brings the chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings This is amazing love, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, that you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, and I would be set free. Oh, 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 Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
give my life into the potter's hand. Call me, guide me, lead me, walk beside me. I give my life into the potter's hand. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure all of my days are held in your hand, crafted into your purse. Gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all my life through your eyes. Time comes in my your holy calling. Set me apart, I know you're drawing me to yourself. Lead me, Lord, I pray. Take me, mold me, use me, and fill me. I give my life into the potter's hand. Call me, guide me, lead me, walk beside me. I give my life into the potter's hand. days are held in your hand and crafted into your perfect plan. Hi, my name is Brian Warner, lead pastor of Bethel. I'm glad that you've joined us for today's message. It's called Secondhand Religion. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Gen Genesis chapter 28. We'll be looking at that in just a few moments. But a question for you to start. Have you ever tried to cut corners to save a little here, a little there? Or, or tried to get by without there being too much cost or time involved? There's a newspaper article years ago called, He Wiped Up as Mr. Cheap, a retired welder who says he separates two-ply toilet paper to save money. And it won the top tightwad awards in the newspaper's How Cheap Are You contest. It's no trouble at all. It just takes a little practice, Louis said. He said the single-ply rolls are just as good as two-ply and save you about 23 cents each. Louis is age 63, and he attributes his frugal ways to growing up with 14 siblings. Well, the Oakland Tribute cited another skin flint uh, in categories of gross, tacky, unbelievable, incredible, and dishonest. And an incredible submission from Elmer Huron and El Cerrito said that when he, his vacuum cleaner becomes full, his bag becomes full, he cuts one end, empties it, and then sews it up for reuse. Not only does it save bags, he says, but sometimes I find a penny in the dust. You know, I, I've got to say it, some things just aren't worth it. Cutting corners doesn't make sense, even if you find a penny in it. Now here's a thought. Cutting spiritual corners doesn't make sense. My main point is this. You, you can't cut corners and grow spiritually. We're going to look at the life of Esau and Jacob and focusing mostly on Jacob. But both settled for second best during their years of growing up. They cut a lot of corners. 
So here's the background to our chapter, chapter 28 today. Jacob was a grandson of Abraham and a son of Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Jacob was one of the great patriarchs or fathers of the nation Israel. In fact, the nation called itself by Jacob's other name, Israel. But before his name was changed to Israel, his character was less than godly. See, Jacob started out as a liar, a cheater, a manipulator. He struggled his life, his entire life, with God. And the turning point for Jacob came after a dramatic all-night wrestling match with God. And in the end, the Lord touched Jacob's hip. And he was a broken man. But he was also then a new man. God renamed him Israel, which means he struggles with God. Through, through the example of Jacob, we learn how God could use flawed people. Flawed but faithful people. Jacob may have been deceitful, but because the Lord worked in his life, he occupies an honored place in the history of the Jewish people. You could find in Hebrews chapter 11 that, that hall of faith chapter. Verse 21 says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. So I want to look at Joseph's, or Jacob's story and hopefully we can learn something of ourselves today. Going all the way back to his birth in Genesis chapter 25, you could read it later. But Jacob and Esau were twins in answer to Isaac's prayer after his wife Rebekah was barren for 20 years. And it turns out that they couldn't get along in the womb. And they jostled each other, the Bible says. Rebekah had asked the Lord about this and he told her that she was carrying boys who would in time father two nations. The Lord also said that the older would serve the younger. Then when Esau was born, Jacob was hot on his heels, actually holding his heel and came in second. So his parents called him Jacob, which means literally, he takes by the heel. Another sense of that name is to deceive or to attack from the rear. Chapter 27 of Genesis talks about his birthright and blessing. So Jacob and Esau were brothers, but very different, opposites in every way. Esau was an outdoorsman while Jacob was a homebody. Esau was short-sighted and he didn't care about down the road. Jacob, however, knew what he wanted, what God had promised Rebekah about his future, and he decided to help God out, and of course, with his mother's help. So you know the story. Involving a bowl of soup for Esau for the birthright and a bountiful meal for Isaac's blessing. You'd think that Jacob got away with it, his deception. And although that he received what Jacob had promised, there were ramifications to his actions. See, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? So Genesis 27 and 28 tells us about Jacob now being on the run. When Esau found out that Jacob deceived Isaac and again shortchanged Esau, he was determined to kill Jacob. Oops. <laughs> Rebekah overheard Esau's threat and told Isaac to send Jacob to her brother Laban to find a wife. So Jacob starts his journey to save his life and find a wife. It also became an adventure of a spiritual nature. God was going to have a few encounters with Jacob to shape his life into the man that Hebrew 11 verse 21 recognized him to be. Now God never said it would be easy. We're never told that the Christian life was, was to be easy, that it was promised to go our way all the ways that we would hope it or want it to be, but it's worthwhile. Before Jacob arrives in Haran, he finds a stone for a pillow and he has a rock-solid sleep and a dream that rocks his world. Now, he must have been so tired and so stressed. It's hard to sleep when you're stressed, isn't it? And your mind goes in a hundred different directions and you have to account, count at least a thousand sheep just to get some shut-eye. Now, let's recap what Jacob's going through when he puts his head down on that hard rock to try and sleep. He cheated his brother from the birthright and blessing. He deceived his father Isaac and he has to run away to save his life and find a wife. He's tired from traveling already. He's saddened by thoughts of home and missing his mom and his dying father. And oh yeah, remembering the death threat of his brother. Let's not forget that. Like sweet dreams, Jacob. Now if you were Jacob, what might your dreams have been like that night? I was picturing it. Maybe something like this. 
You're hanging off a cliff just by your bare knuckles holding on. And your brother Esau is stepping now on your fingers and there's hate in his eyes. You're yelling to your father Isaac for help and Isaac is saying, but how do I know that it's you and that you're not going to trick me again? Your mother Rebecca, she's trying to push Esau out of the way and when she does, it causes you to lose grip and you're falling and you're falling and you're falling and you wake up in a cold sweat, a clenched jaw and a stiff neck from that rock pillow. That would be the dream that Jacob maybe deserved and the restless sleep that he should have had, but he has a divine dream from God instead. One commentator says it's a message of real, uninterrupted, and close communication between heaven and earth, between God in his glory and man in their sin. So Jacob dreams of a ladder reaching up to heaven with angels going up and coming down. And God shows up and God speaks out and speaks into Jacob's life. The God who had come to renew his promises made to Abraham and Isaac and now to Jacob. So this is awesome, but also Jacob is afraid at the same time. Before this event, Jacob didn't have a real personal relationship with God. He was more dependent on his parents and their faith. And he was about to grow up fast, wasn't he? It's not good enough to know about God and go through the motions. You have to know him personally, and there is a difference. God spoke to Jacob and gave him the same promise he had given to Abraham and Isaac, assuring Jacob that he would give him many descendants who would possess the land of Canaan, that God would be with him and watch over him and bring him back to the land that he left. So here's the story, and I'm going to read Genesis chapter 28 from verse 10 to 15. You could follow along in your Bible. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching into heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Jacob recognized God now for who he is, his his personal God. Not just the God that his parents knew and, and grandparents, but there's a bit more ownership here. There's a bit more experience. And he commits himself to God who will protect him, provide for him, and prepare for him because there's a plan. When Jacob awakes, he takes that stone, puts it upright, anoints it with oil, and names that place Bethel, which means the house of God. Now verse 20 shows us more of his response. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and Of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I want to look at these vows that Jacob is saying based on the experience that night. First of all, protection. Remember, Esau wanted to kill him, and he's now on a -a walkathon to save his life. And he's on his way to his uncle Laban's place, 450 miles away. That's a lot of distance to cover. He needs protection. Verse 20, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey that I'm taking. Probably wasn't away from home much. 
being closer to his mother and enjoying the quiet life and staying close to home where he was safe. Unlike his brother Esau, who loved the hunt, who loved to be out in the fields, who would be gone for long days, maybe, many days at a time. But Jacob finds himself now among the wilderness, among new lands, and the uncertainty of what lies between him at that moment and 450 miles away, he needed God's protection. The second is he needed God's provision. Verse 20. He says, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. See, he didn't have much. His mother heard Esau was thinking of killing Jacob and and had Isaac bless Jacob and command him to go. Go at once. He couldn't afford to, to plan and bring everything that he wanted. He had to be on the run to save his life right away. His blessing and birthright he had, but he needed God's provision on the journey. He left with nothing and he depended on God to provide the basics of food and clothes. And there are going to be times when there's no one to help you. So what do you do? Who do you depend on? Well, Jacob recognized that God was someone that he could depend on. And so can we as Christians. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Scripture says, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and To him who knocks, the door will be opened. Provision. And the third thing is preparation. That God had a plan and knew what he was doing with Jacob's life. Verse 21. So that I return safely. Jacob knew that he was leaving but not for good. That he would come back. He wanted to come back safely. Getting older and assuming responsibility is not always fun in games like you know, the younger generation might think. There's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of learning still that has to happen. And Jacob knew that his journey was going to be a learning experience and he wanted to come back safely. There would be adjustments. There would be attitude checks. There would be risks involved. There would be dependence on God, more on God, less on himself, and that he would have to take the time to know God in a personal way. He realized that he couldn't do life alone and shouldn't do life alone by himself and doing things his way. He needed to be led by God. He needed to come back. Verse 21, Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Well, let me just wrap this up. We can learn so much from Esau and Jacob about the importance of appreciating and valuing the godly heritage we have. Let's not take our faith for granted or our parents' faith or grandparents' faith or those people that are speaking into our lives and leading and living a godly example. Esau, what did he do? He he threw it away. He forfeited what was his. Jacob wanted the blessing, blessing without knowing the blesser. And so he took matters into his own hands to get what he thought was his, but right away instead of later. And both settled for second best. Jacob came to a place in his life where he realized his need for God and not just the blessing of God. He needed to know God personally, not just as the God of my parents, but my God, my God. Let me ask you a question. Where are you in relationship with God? Do you know him? Do you really know him or just know of him? Do you know him personally in your heart of hearts as your Lord, your God, your Savior, the one who died for you? That Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that that you could receive forgiveness of your sins, that you can make things right, that you could decide to follow him all the days of your life, becoming more like him each day. That's knowing him and living for him. Remember, you can't cut corners and grow spiritually. Don't settle for second best when you could have God's best, when you could live life God's way. Yes, every one of us is flawed, but God is faithful, and he will do a work in your life if you allow him to. Would you pray this prayer? God, thank you for revealing yourself to us, your love, your forgiveness, the second chances, and so many more. Jesus, you change lives from the inside out. Change those who are watching uh, from knowing of you to knowing you. 
in such a real personal way. Help us to grow deeper in our experience with you and on a personal level that calls us to follow you no matter the cost and for all the days of our lives that you would fashion us and do that work in our lives that people see Christ, that we're becoming more like Jesus every day and in every way. Thank you that you protect us. Thank you that you provide for us. Thank you that you have a plan for our lives and it's the best plan. So we trust you with our lives and we say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.